regularly scheduled program will not be seen at this time. Join us for this special presentation. This portion of Discovery is sponsored in part by new EcoChoice trash bags. It is the largest thing that ever existed in the history of the universe, larger than any dinosaur ever dreamed to be, which means that you know, it is the largest form of animal life that we are aware of anywhere. We coexist on this planet with an extraordinary other brain, bigger than ours, some evidence that it has more complexity than ours, and we don't have a clue as to what it's used for. Not the slightest idea. Dr. Roger Payne is a noted conservationist and whale scholar who discovered that deep beneath the sea, whales were singing intricate songs. He joins me for a conversation about the creatures he loves and how the danger that threatens them threatens us all. Payne tracks his whales around the world, but his American headquarters are here in Lincoln, Massachusetts at the Whale Conservation Institute. Roger, when you look at your life today and think back of Roger Payne as a young boy, do you see there the seeds and the root of what you do now? Were you a young kid who cared about animals, cared about wildlife, cared about music? Well, I, I was a fish out of water, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, I, I know in, those. <laughs> <laughs> I lived in Manhattan Island, surrounded by buildings, and I used to walk down the streets looking up at the sky so that I would not have to see the buildings around me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know what it was I wanted. And then, then one June morning, when I was about 12, we went to the country, and I remember waking and hearing the sounds of birds and soft air coming through a window and uh, the, the feeling of spring, the smell of flowers and so on. I, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I couldn't believe it had happened. And uh, that's what... I mean, it, it was like... It's like hitting the gong when you hit it exactly in the center and the whole thing resonates, and that was the it moment. It said to you, I belong here. That's right. What about the notion of becoming a scientist? That probably follows from my father, who was uh, an electrical engineer, and so one always does what their yeah. dad or starts thinking they're going to do what their dad does. But my mother was a musician, and when she played quartets and so on, I always heard mm -hmm. that, and music saturated my life, and I loved it. I didn't love it at first, but I loved it eventually. <laughs> you came to love the cello. That's right, I did. Because it seems a contradiction, uh, music and science. Well, I wanted somehow to live something that had music in it. And so what I went into was acoustics. That's when I realized that, ah, you could do something that was musical or musicaloid, yeah. sort of, namely acoustics, but which had animals in it as well. So that was the combination of these two things, music and the wild world, which I had fallen in love with. Like doing what? I mean, what would you study that would combine the two? Well, what, anything at all... What I started with was... Uh, bats. How do bats locate a moth? Then I went to owls. How does an owl locate its prey? Turns out it hears it and can focus its attention on it. Then on to moths. How do moths avoid a bat which is trying to attack them? Is that directly linked to whales? Is there a st straight link? There? Well, everything is acoustics. I yeah. started out with with bats, then owls, then moths. As a friend of mine once said, I went from one fly-by-night organism to another. <laughs> but finally, getting away from nocturnal creatures, I finally got on to whales. Yeah. That was, was it a moment, uh, or was it just an inexorable process that led you to whales as, as your own focus? It, it had several starts, which little false starts, and then finally it went. First, I heard a recording of a right whale, and it was the most mysterious, strangest, oddest sound I'd ever heard. Never heard anything like it. And I played it at least, I don't know, 300 times, I would say, on a recording. What did it sound like? It sort of goes... <laughs> it's a strange yeah. inner sound. It all happens inside this animal, and you can hear it. And uh, you can hear it. Uh, I don't know, it's the soul of the animal speaking to you. It's not yeah. the animal. Resonation. 
station. They're yeah. like the center of a gong. I mean, that's the same thing. And then after that came, I was out on a beach one time, and I saw a dead dolphin. And I, in fact, I heard that there was a whale. It sure wasn't a whale. Well, there was a whale, and that dolphins are whales, but it was a dead dolphin. And I went out, and by the time I got there, everybody else had cleared the beach. It was raining, and this dolphin was lying on the edge of the waves, and it had somebody had carved their initials in the side of it. Somebody else had stuck a cigar butt in the blowhole, and somebody else had hacked off its tail and taken it home, its flukes, and taken it home. And I, it gave me a feeling um, I cannot describe to you. It was a feeling of just sort of frustration and anger. This is the way humanity interacts with whales. And I decided then and there that I would do something, if I could, to change people's perceptions of the wild world, to change, to make people recognize the importance of the fact that there is an entire world with which we live, which we trample on and dispose things into and wreck and so on, which is of not only the utmost beauty, but of the utmost importance to our lives. And until we recognize that, we're lost. There's no hope at all. If your grandchild comes to you, if you have a grandchild at some point, and he comes to you or she comes to you and says, Granddaddy, what's a whale? I would say it's an unnearable mystery that swims in the sea, and it's a great, gentle, cloud-like being. It is the largest thing that ever existed in the history of the universe, larger than any dinosaur ever dreamed to be, which means that you know, it is the largest form of animal life that we are aware of anywhere as you look out through all the stars in this galaxy, all the galaxies in our local galaxy cluster, and all the clusters of galaxies throughout the world. It is the single largest thing. And the single largest individual of that species, the blue whales, the largest of all the whales, single largest blue whale was an animal 106 feet long. It was killed in February of 1928 or something like that off the Antarctic, and somebody looked at it and had a reaction. Wow, that's a big one. You know, hey, maybe we should measure this. So they measured it, and gee, that's a big whale. It was chopped up for oil. Basically, it was boiled down for oil. The skeleton was chucked. The meat was chucked. They didn't keep it in those days. That's how we treated the largest thing that ever occurred in the history of the world. Two basic species of whales, one tooth and... and Baleen whales. Ba that was the biggest is the sperm whale, oh. and things like killer whales, belugas, dolphins, flipper... Uh, yeah. which is a bottlenose dolphin. Do you have, of, of all those we've talked about, I mean, I would think the humpback that says the most to you that is your own favorite? Probably, certainly the songs of humpbacks are without equal. Other whales sing. Yeah. Bowheads sing. Blues sing. Finns sing. Very, the fin and the blues sing a very simple, simple song. Yeah. But the songs of humpbacks, they move me. They hit me. Why? Well... I don't know. And if I knew, I'd be a lot closer to answering the real question, which is, what is this connection between whales and people? Charlie Rose and Roger Payne will return on the Discovery Channel. My son and I figure it took 50,000 beer cans. People ask me if we drank them all. Ronnie, did we do that? Now Ruffy's is making trash bags with recycled milk jugs. Maybe we'll drink more milk. New EcoChoice trash bags, made tough, made with one-third recycled plastic bottles. Dan figures the time he saves using Microsoft Excel for his budget is time well spent with others. Microsoft Excel, the spreadsheet for Windows. We'd like to point out that for 10 million people, Microsoft Windows is an easier way to use their PCs. We'd now like to point out how easy it is to see for yourself. Just call 1-800-882-2000. Twice the power is a lot of power. It's like having twice as many plumbers on the job. Professional plumbers on professional strength liquid plumber. The key is to get more power to the clog. Yeah, all the other liquid drain openers dilute. They wimp out. This stuff doesn't. It's more powerful. It cuts through water like a torpedo. So twice as much power attacks the hair clog and pow. Goodbye, clog. Imagine if we were twice as powerful. <laughs> yeah, we'd have to raise our rate. <laughs> Get twice the power to the clog. Get professional strength liquid plumber in the gray bottle. Theirs was a great civilization. 
steeped in science and the arts. Then, five centuries ago, they came. First the Europeans, then the Africans. And a new culture was born, vibrant and tumultuous, a growing force in the world today. Now rediscover Latin America's stormy history through the eyes of renowned author Carlos Fuentes, The Buried Mirror, premiering Sunday at 10 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. When did you first hear, hear with your own ears, uh, the sound, the song? The first time I ever heard it was in the, in a, <laughs> the engine room of a ship. There are a few noisier places. Than an engine room. Clank, 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 clank. Everything <laughs> throbbing and shaking and vibrating. You set a cup down and it shimmers on the top. <laughs> and uh, the, it was in a, in a ship uh, in Bermuda. And the man who played them for me was a wonderful chap, now dead, named Frank Watlington, who was one of the pioneers in recording humpback songs. And um, he said, here, listen to this. And he sort of slapped these headphones on. And I was, my mind was completely blown. I had never heard any animal make a sound like this in my life before. No one has heard sounds more extraordinary than those, I don't think. But I didn't know they existed. And he had extraordinarily beautiful recordings of them yeah. and what uh, what what did it sound like well <clears throat> they go they have they have rumbles and grunts and high keening cries and whistles and beautiful beautiful sounds i would i would try to imitate anything else but imitating but a humpback that. is i feel like i'm treading on uh you know how do they make the sound nobody knows it's a it's a complete mystery and as long as they are an endangered species it's an endangered mystery it's um Probably by moving air around inside their bodies. What else is interesting about it? Because they repeat the sounds. That's right. But they can go for a long time without repeating or do a short time? The song is anywhere up to 35 minutes. Usually it's about 15. That's a common length. And it's composed of a series of five to, or in two to eight themes. And each one of these themes is a series of repeated little phrases, all each one just like the one before. Sometimes a, a theme will be a series of phrases which start simple and it, it adds a little furbelo and then two furbelos and then three furbelos so that it becomes, it, it evolves as it goes along. But then it comes, the ne next time you hear the whale sing the song, you hear exactly that same performance of first simple, then furbelo, then two furbelos and so on. And, and repeat it almost exactly? Yes, oh, very exactly. I mean, with enough precision so that there is absolutely no question that what you're hearing is an effort to produce the same thing you just heard. And what's the purpose of the songs? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, we don't really know. They are sung by males, probably in hopes of a female, perhaps as a means of challenging another male. Uh, they are sung in... Perhaps to attract the females? Yeah, pr pr I think uh, my theory is, yes, that it's to attract females. I think it's select... I think their structure is selected by females. Yeah. And because they change all the time, it means that they... You know, they're, they're messing around. They're inveterate composers. They're like people in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> What's the evidence to, to suggest that maybe it is like the peacock? The sound is what the feathers are for the peacock. Well, a, a peacock displays this glorious thing, this great fan of feathers in front of a female when he's attempting to seduce her. Right. And I think that that's exactly what a humpback male is doing. He's displaying this glorious thing. It happens to be acoustic instead yeah. of visual. How far can it go? 
Now, the sounds of a humpback don't go all, well, they go very far by what you and I would normally think, probably 10, 15 miles, something like that at the most. But they're quite high in frequency. If you look at the song of another species, a blue or a finback, a, a, a whale, these are very, very low sounds, ideally suited to traveling enormous distances. And if you calculate how far they go before they drop to the level of background noise, you discover that nowadays they could go several hundred miles. And before the ocean was, as it now is, completely polluted with ship's traffic noise, yeah. they would go several thousand miles. So that these A thousand miles? Oh, more several thousand. Several thousand miles. So that they would go completely across oceans in those days. How do we know that? Well... Because the federal government has spent billions of your tax dollars dealing with how sound propagates in the ocean so that we can trap submarines and track them around and know where they are. There is this story that um, the Navy hmm. kept hearing some of these sounds and did not want to believe they were whales and, in fact, thought they were Russian submarines. Well, well you, it's, uh, that's a cl very close. Here, here was the idea. You know those... Um, uh, there, there is a wonderful device that you put in your living room and, and it, 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 it uh, fills the living room with sound and it yeah. sets up a standing wave pattern and then mm -hmm. if, a, if a burglar comes in the night he interrupts the standing wave pattern and the alarm goes off is what it amounts to. Now when that system is in operation you, what you have is you fill the space with standing waves and somebody thought that maybe these loud, low-frequency <laughs> sounds... They were too loud to possibly be made by animals. Yeah. And, you know, hey, no way they were made by <laughs> animals. So the, the, the question was, what is this? What's going on out there? And the answer was, well, maybe the Russians have insonified the entire ocean so that as our submarines move around... They can track it, them. It, well, exactly. They yeah. can hear them upset standing wave patterns and therefore track them. So for a long time, there was loads and loads of money available to study what turned out to be whales. What do we know about the intelligence of whales because we're all aware of the largeness of their brains. We don't know a lot about, in fact, we don't know anything about what it is used for. I would say... And that is an important question. Exactly. I would say that is the single, to me, that's the single most interesting question in biology today. We coexist on this planet with an extraordinary other brain, bigger than ours, some evidence that it has more complexity than ours, and we don't have a clue as to what it's used for. Not the slightest idea of what it's Any used for. Any guesses? Oh, they're all... They're, they're guesses, but they don't really... I mean, informed guesses. Yeah, informed guesses. E <clears throat> things like better acoustic analysis. But, I mean, my Lord, you can see in the... In the, the, the brain of a, of a bat is about as big as the tip of my little finger. Right. And with that, it can do things that are so sophisticated acoustically that it just causes you to shake your head. Now, why does a whale need a brain, you know, this big, as in the case of a sperm whale. And my feeling is probably it needs it for some sort of, I don't know, social function or social interaction. Because if you have a brain, particularly when you're in your early days of life, you're spending uh, your metabolism, your energy, just maintaining the thing. It's a very expensive thing to own. I mean, you don't just yeah. get away with owning it. So, so wait, let me understand that. So if you have a brain that large, yeah. clearly it had a use. It has an incredibly important use. It has a use so important that you're willing to spend a quarter to a third of your entire yeah. metabolism on maintaining it, just, right. just keeping it running, ticking over. And you wouldn't basically. keep it running if you didn't use it. Exactly. But the question is, what do you use it for? And nobody has any idea. Now, it could be, uh, the best example I know that suggests what you use it for is something which it comes from an argument about, about social systems which are involved with something called reciprocal altruism. Reciprocal altruism is that, you know, uh, you do me a favor and I do you a favor in return. And the whole trick, the way we're working to do this, is that I'm trying to do the smallest amount for you that I possibly can in order to get the biggest possible right. return. Well, now, one way would be uh, we're walk I'm walking down a river and I see that you're drowning. So I reach down, I pick up a stick, I extend it, you grab it, I pull you to shore, you owe me your life. And now I'm going to get a big one. But I'll only get a big one if you and I are together enough so that I can collect on it, so that a great opportunity comes. <laughs> And so, I don't know, we're out, we have been starving for two weeks, and we're really out of it, and we come to some blueberry bush, and you say, Roger, this is for you. And I know we're both hungry, and I know that we would both like to eat at this point, but this bush is for you. And I, I think, owe you. Charlie, I just, that's good enough, I'll buy that, that's good. 
But then I notice that you're behaving very strangely. But you don't normally behave this way. And actually, you've spotted a much better bl blueberry bush in the distance, and you're trying to keep me from noticing it. <laughs> so I have to have a brain that's good enough to detect cheating. As soon as the, de the cheating becomes detectable, then the cheating gets better. Well, then the detector gets better. And the, each pressure is to make the brain smarter on both sides. That may be where the human brain came from. We live in long lived social groups where we can collect on debts and where we can notice that, well, he's not really pulling his share, he's not doing his part. And so as that works along, we get, we, we get a brain fancy enough to make up good cheats and to detect good cheats. And that, therefore, would say, where would you expect to find fancy brains? You'd expect them in animals which have long-lived social groups. If you have groups that are long-lived, then you can have an explanation for what the brain is. Well, where do you find them? You find them in people, you find them in uh, elephants, and you find them in whales. And also you could say that the intelligence of a human being is, is something which is enormously fancier, apparently, than it seems to need to be. The same brain that supported our ancestors grunting in caves all but just a few thousand years ago. That same brain can now do string physics. So it could be that, you know, the brains of whales could do the equivalent of string physics if they had a language and if they had a means of accessing that ability. But my suspicion is they probably don't, that in fact what they have is an enormously complex machine which just allows them to barely get along, to do the equivalent of what we did when we were back in caves, just barely making it. What's the reciprocal altruism for the whales, might okay. it be? <clears throat> well, we, we know some, a wonderful example in right whales, which is a species I've been studying in Argentina for many years. In right whales, the males cooperate, helping each other to mate with a female. Now, the way they do this is that the females are bigger in right whales than the males are, so they can beat up any sole male, just avoid him if they want to, hey, just move out of the way. Can, yeah. Exactly, minor nuisance. <laughs> but if these males, it, when a female is trying to, uh, to avoid matings, and this goes on a lot, the, you have a male in the middle, uh, excuse me, you have the female in the middle, and she's belly up, so she can't be mated with. And you have a male to her right, a male to her left, and another one holding his breath underneath. Now, eventually, she's got to breathe. Right. And when she does, she's going to turn over. She'll either turn towards that guy or she'll turn towards this guy. She starts yeah. to roll. That gives them a chance. And right. when she's on enough of an even keel to breathe, this one has a chance to mate with her. And that's the formation that they keep. They have long lived social groups in which males occupy these positions. Yeah. Now, when a, a, a female can be mated with if she's pushed underneath the water just slightly, just a few inches, a well, foot, foot or two underneath the water. And I've w uh, watched for years, I watched males pushing and m females under, obviously attempting to mate with them, and they never worked. It was a total failure. And uh, all it worked often that another male would get a chance. And I'd think, you know, that's a bozo. Why does he waste his time? I mean, and so on. Until I realized it was me who was the bozo. What I was seeing was males assisting other males to mate. Now, the reason is that in that species, the, the it, it, it is a multiple male mating system, several males mating with the same female. And the size of the testes of one of these males is simply enormous. In a blue whale, largest animal on Earth, you get testes that are about 70 kilos, something like that, so about 160 pounds. In the case of a, of a right whale, a much smaller species now, so therefore should have proportionally smaller testes, it is one metric ton, 2,200 pounds for the testes. Why? Because the male is putting out enormous quantities of sperm to compete with the fact that the female has just ma mated with a male before she mates with him, and his only hope of having any chance at being the father of the young is if he can basically wash out the entire contribution of the previous male, replacing it with his own. But her strategy is, the female's strategy, is to somehow um, select the male she wants to select, but she hasn't a choice because she's got crowded males around her. So what her strategy should be is to wait until she's been mated with and then leave immediately. W mated with by the male she wants and to leave. So it's this business of assisting each other yeah. uh, in this kind of a mating situation in right whales I think is a lovely example of, 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 of reciprocal altruism. Right. Do whales travel I mean, uh, together? I mean, are they, if you find one, you're likely to find... Yeah. That's a, 
That's a wonderful question, but it has a trick in it. You and I are out on the ocean together. We see a bunch of whales. We say, yeah. hey, there's a herd of whales. Right. But <clears throat> that is the visual determination of what is the herd of whales. I mean, that's what we see together in a cluster. But since they can hear each other such enormous distances, if you spell herd, H-E-A-R-D, instead of H-E-R-D, you get a better idea for the fact that what they can hear around them, that's the group they're traveling with. And hey, it may stretch across the horizon, maybe miles away, who knows? Charlie Rose and Roger Payne will return on the Discovery Channel. Safari, Saturdays at 8 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. It's not how much you pay that counts, but what you get for your money. This consumer tip was brought to you by Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. He was a brilliant doctor who had given up. Okay, then. Run and see what I get you. Until he met a simple man. I think you have a good heart. You bow your heads and take this nightmare like you have no choice. I think we should stand up. And together, they turned a place of struggle into a city of joy. I'm glad you came to my country. Patrick Swayze, City of Joy, rated PG-13. Starts Friday at a theater near you. Look at these red marks. These old glasses do nothing but pinch. They're a pain. You don't have to put up with glasses that don't fit anymore. Now Lens Crafters brings you better fit for greater comfort. Lens Crafters glasses fit your snug points with features like new self-adjusting snug fit pads that flex to gently and securely hug your nose. No more pinching. I never knew glasses could be this comfortable. Lens Crafters. Better fit for greater comfort. In about an hour. Which scoopable litter would the experts prefer? A leading litter or new Scoop Fresh cat litter? They both clump. But does your litter freshen between scoops? Well, that proves it. New Scoop Fresh freshens better between scoops. The time has finally come for the cordless power roller from Wagner. Now you control the flow of paint. So the Wagner Power Roller can cut jobs in half. Smoothly and evenly, it can cover areas twice as fast. And cleanup is a snap. So you can finish one job and do another. Get your hands on a real value, because the value of Wagner keeps on rolling. Now available on home video. In the company of whales. A breathtaking feature-length film voyage into the mysterious realm of the largest animals to ever live on Earth. For over 30 million years, their song, their dance, their utter majesty has graced the planet. Now, witness firsthand these gentle giants' extraordinary intelligence in a world intimately linked with our own fate. Two years in the making, beautifully photographed in 15 locations around the world, if you love whales, this spectacular motion picture brings you whale encounters never before captured on film. To order in the company of whales for only $24.95, call 1-800-537-8500. Call now with your credit card ready. How long have whales been with us? Whaleish creatures have been around for about 60 million years, 50 million years, depending on who you read. And we've been around for maybe a million years, so that, you know, we are the new kids on the block. I mean, we're just... The world seems to have been in balance in, as regards whales when we arrived on the scene, and now we just laid about us in all directions and have done disastrous things with this wonderful brain that we are so proud of, which so, you could say is, is the... You know, greatest misadaptation which has ever appeared in the history of life on Earth has threatened our own existence in fewer... Yeah, we have used our own brain to threaten our own extinction. In fewer generations... Yeah, and than the extinction of other species. Exactly. And we've done that in fewer generations than any other species of which I'm aware has ever been threatened with extinction. So that, you so know... in some way we're not quite as smart as the whales and others. Exactly. That's why I would say that calling a whale intelligent may not be, by our standards, may not be much of a compliment to a whale. Have they done anything to threaten their, or bring about their own extinction? 
As far as I know, no. They show that it is possible to own a fancy thing like this brain and not destroy the world with it. What's the threat to whales? Because we've all seen the incredible video of dolphins being caught up in whalers, in, in, in nets by the tuna fishing. Fishermen. Yet there are those who say, while that's awful and while that's decimating the species, not even close to the real danger. Yeah, I, that's, that's right. I'm a great believer that the real problem that whales face is pollution, the slow accumulation of toxic stuff inside whales. There is going on right now, throughout the world, not just whales, in us as well, there is kind of a slow graying process, the accumulation of more and more and more stuff that we just carelessly discard. We discard it because we think we're throwing it out, but what we're just learning is, no, we're not throwing it out, we're just rearranging it, we're just putting it elsewhere in the room. It's as though I said to you, take the garbage out, and you picked up the, pa the pail of garbage, and you walked over and you set it in the corner of the living room. Well, that's not really taking it out. Yeah. And it stays with us. Yeah, and that's the trouble. There is no out. It's all in. It's all part of the world that we live in. And we can't get rid of some things. We can get rid of things that recycle, that break down spontaneously, that turn back into... Biodegradable and all that. Exactly. But we can't get rid of some of the synthetic molecules that we make. And some of those absolutely no way of dealing with it all we nor nor do other animals and some of those slowly accumulate in tissues of animals and then because they can't be removed by kidneys uh, they are in fact they're just there and so when the animal gets eaten by another animal all of what that animal took in is now in the other animal and so on as you move up food pyramids until you get to a predator that lives at the top of the food py pyramid and that predator will have multiplied at each stage of the pyramid up to it by a factor of about 10. And the result is that you have a real threat to anything which is eating at the top. Who lives at the top? Whales do, and we do. Whales and we are most at risk. And the whales are dying from this toxicity now, and that's their signal to us? We have... We have is that it? Well, not, not quite. We, what we have is we have... We have whales that are dying by the thousands, in some cases, of unknown causes. And we have a whole bunch of probable causes. So we have the smoking gun and we have the corpse, but we haven't yet proved that the bullet left the gun and went over and hit the corpse. Now my feeling is, give me a break. <laughs> what else? <laughs> I mean, it's so likely that that's what happened that, I mean, I think we should even be interested in it. We should do something about it. That's what I think. But here's where some of your fellow scientists wade in and say, you can't prove it, Roger. We're in the business of proving things, so they don't say it's science unless you can prove it. Yeah, well, a lot of them also say off record. They'll say, no, I believe this is the case. You know, it must be the case. What else yeah. could they... What's the evidence of this kind of toxicity going well, up the food chain? Okay. There are so many compounds that we could be talking about, that, but I want to focus on one group. It's something called organohalogens, okay? It's a group, and people don't even know the name of them, for the most part. These are, DDT was an organohalogen, and these are substances which contain chlorine or fluorine or bromine. These are three halogens attached to an organic molecule. And they have as a characteristic that they are incredibly insoluble in water. Some of them are as insoluble as gold is in seawater, for example. But they're very soluble in fats, as soluble as sugar is in water, for example. So that what happens is that when these molecules reach the ocean, the ocean acts as a giant distribution system, takes them out and delivers them to all the fat molecules that are out there, and they immediately go into solution in the fat molecules, and now here they are sitting in the fat. They first they get into plants, then into the little single cell animals that eat right. these plants, then up, 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 until they finally get to an animal which is... Uh, is a predator, for example, th that a human might eat. And then the human eats that fish, and is, if it's loaded with PCBs, it gets that PCBs. Those PCBs go into their body and stay there forever. Now, the federal government says that you can't sell fish or anything else if it has more than five parts per million of some of these organohalogens in it. Uh, if you have 50 parts per million, you must dispose of them in specially marked containers in special facilities that can break them down. So what do you find out there? You find killer whales in mid-ocean. I mean, they're out in mid-ocean, 400 parts per million. Not 50, not 5, Four but 400 parts per million. If you come in closer and you get in an estuary, a river mouth, for example, the St. Lawrence River, you get up to beluga whales, 600 parts per million, and some extreme individuals, 3,200 parts per million. And then you get to 
bottlenose dolphins off the east coast of the United States, the, the winner so far is an animal with 6,900 parts per million. Now, these animals are swimming dox toxic dump sites, basically. They, they would be eligible for Superfund, you know, if you could right. clean them up. Yeah. Right, you, if you could clean them up, and you can't. It's only recently been found out how these substances affect a living system. And one of the ways they affect it is they diminish the ability of its immune system to protect it. So if you diminish the immune system's ability to fight disease, then you can die of anything. And one of the characteristics that is found now of mass die-offs of whales, and there have been a great many of them recently, is that they seem to be dying of a lot of different things. Suggesting their immune system is dramatically reduced and so they're susceptible to all variety of kinds of... Exactly. Precisely. And I want to turn that word suggesting into, I want to know, is that what did it? In other words, is there a connection between these substances? I believe there is. Absolutely, I believe there is. And there are a lot of other people who believe there is, too. But are they also responsible scientists who don't? Uh, well, they're responsible scientists. It's not, uh, any responsible scientist will say, we don't know. Right. And everybody else, there are those who are out there saying, we don't know, we don't know. Of course we don't yeah. know. But we have a lot of reason to suspect it's the truth. What can we do? What we need to do is find out. We need to find out how much of this stuff is out there, and we need to show the connection that, yes, it is diminishing the immune systems of whales, and then we need to know how long it lasts inside whales. The reason it's important to know why, how long it lasts in the bodies of the whales is the most insidious part of all of this, which is, if you are a mother mammal, like a whale, and you nurse your baby, what you are actually doing is you are dumping into your baby your lifetime's accumulation. She, the, the, the calf, would have the same toxicity That's as right. the mother. That's right. Picks it up from the mother. She's received some actually when she was in the uterus. Yes, it does pass into the young in the uterus. And it also, she receives more from her mother in her mother's milk. As she gives birth to a baby of her own, then she dumps not only what she got from her mother, but what she also picked up on her own during her life. So she now dumps into her baby roughly twice what she got from her mother. And that baby, if she's a female baby, will dump into her babies three times, and so on, up a chain. Now, if that is happening, if, in fact, these substances last long enough in the bodies of whales, then, in fact, they're going to go extinct. And you're saying, we don't have much time. Yes, that's what I'm saying. There was some study about the Great Lakes that touched on this one. What did it say? What it said is that the, the, the Great Lakes is a... Is a wildly polluted area in terms of organohalogens. And what we've seen from life which comes and touches at the edge of the Great Lakes is, in many cases from these organohalogens, disastrous circumstances. Things like birds with crossed bills, without bills, you know, or the lower half, unfortunately, gone. Gee, that's too bad. There's a man who has done work on uh, uh, embryos of chicks of cormorants living along the Great Lakes. And he found all sorts of chicks hatching with strange conditions until one day he thought, hey, wait a minute, I'm working on the ones that make it long enough to hatch. What about the ones that don't get that far and are still left in the egg? So then he began opening eggs which had clearly died and examining those. And the most extraordinary one he hit is that I saw was an embryo that was consisted of a heart, fine-looking heart, with two eyes on it. That was it. Total animal. I mean, these sort of... A heart with two eyes. A heart with two eyes. And, you know, this sort of animal is coming from some major problem with its developmental biology. What about humans? There, there, there is a group of Native Americans living on the shore of one of the Great Lakes mm -hmm. who eat fish all the time, have a high fish diet, and they're taking through these, fi in, through these fish, they're taking extremely high concentrations of some of these organohalogens. A study was done to cover a great many of these people looking at children because the children, have, they show learning problems. They show inability to focus their attention. They show sort of, you know, all over the place in terms of not focusing. Within the group that they were looking at, there were 17 children, however, that were, re were, were just intractable. They refused. They could not be a part of this study. And finally somebody thought, I wonder who these 17 children are. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they... What's, and what's, it turns out these are the 17 children of the 17 mothers of the 17 highest concentrations of these organohalogens. Now, doesn't prove it. Hey, it could be something else. Who knows? But what does it say? What it says to me is overwhelming circumstantial evidence for the fact that 
this is a problem and that we got to do something about it. Let me come back to whales, too, because how many of those whales are actually dying because of this, this destruction of their immunity system? Okay. In 1989, the, we lost, in just a few weeks, we lost half the population of bottlenose dolphins on the west coast I mean, on the east coast of the United States, the west side of the North Atlantic Ocean, lost half the population. Now, why? Why did they die? They suddenly started dying by the hundreds. And the answer was, well, they were looked at, and a few of them were analyzed, had very high concentrations of these substances, but only a few were analyzed for that. A lot of other things were looked at, but not very much in terms of organohalogens. Now, that, I feel, should have been done more. And in other die-offs that have come along since, more funds should be made available for the people who do that kind of work to show the connection between uh, these organohalogens and the diseases which they're seeing in the, fish, in, the, in the dolphins. And lots and lots of dolphins had all sorts of other different kinds of lesions and things in them. At the same time, we lost 10% of the population of humpback whales that feeds in the Gulf of Maine, the area around uh, Maine and Massachusetts. And, and, uh, and there's no other explanation. Well, there, there could be a variety of other ex explanations. I don't think there's any that is as likely as this. Nobody has certainly impressed me with anything that seems... And like. you are 75% um, sure this is... Your instinct is right on this? I mean, 90% well, uh, sure? I, I, don't, I, I don't know how to measure such a, a, a surety. All I can say is I see nothing else out there which would say to me that it is the likely cause of this kind of thing. And I see that as being a wildly likely cause of it. I would like to see if there's a connection. And just to continue ignoring that fact, not do anything about it, not uh, you know, give, subscribe the funds to make it happen, yeah. that's And why do you think we ignore it? I think people at the moment probably don't want to know. It's just, it's just too awful. I mean, you know, hey... It's, you it's, can't uh, eat fish out of the... And yeah. the whales are dying, and, exactly. and everything is going to. And pop. we may be next. But my feeling is, that's the wrong conclusion. I have the greatest strength of feeling that, in fact, people can solve the problems that face them once they realize they have a problem. At the moment, only a few people realize it. Very few have done anything about it. But when people finally get disturbed about something that really bothers them, then they act. And, and when they act, they really change the world. Can you give me a good example of that? I think there's a classic one we all just lived through it. It's watching the dissolution of the Soviet Union. It's watching the Berlin Wall fall. We don't, we don't need some fancy technological fix. What we need is just to change our minds. That's all we have to do. And that's what I think can happen in the case of the environmental movement, is that as soon as people change their minds, as soon as they go forward, then things will happen. There was a period in the history of this country when it must have been when people were trying to stop slavery, when I'm sure arguments were given, you know, are you out of your mind? Do you realize that the entire the economy, base of exactly, that, right? if this country is based on slavery and you're telling me to stop slavery? And the answer is yes, and we did it. And I think... So a critical mass has to develop. Exactly. And I think that critical mass exists. I think it's sitting at home right now, quietly waiting to move. And when it moves, I think the world will change so fast that all you can do is watch. Charlie Rose and Roger Payne will return on the Discovery Channel. The Discovery Channel's original production, In the Company of Whales, presents the serious threats of pollution on marine life and introduces us to people who are making a difference. People like Dr. Roger Payne and his Whale Conservation Institute are investigating the long-term effects of toxins on the world's oceans through a research project on environmental contamination and ocean toxics, Ecotox for short. Now, here's where you come in. Call 1-800-937-7737 and join forces with Dr. Payne and the family of researchers supported by the Whale Conservation Institute. With your call and an $8 donation, proceeds will help to support Ecotox research. You'll also receive a packet with letters that will let you personally tell your congressman and senator you're concerned about the issues of marine pollution. Let lawmakers know that the time to act is now and funds are needed for research to investigate the links between ocean pollution and the mysterious deaths surrounding marine mammals. Call now and let your voice be heard. When what you eat and drink upsets your stomach, you want a medicine that works directly on your stomach. Pepto-Bismol. As it coats, Pepto delivers powerful medicine right where you hurt. Pepto-Bismol.
To get rid of her gray, my wife can spend 40 minutes. But I discovered the five-minute hair coloring. The revolutionary discovery called Just for Men from the leader in men's hair coloring. Simply apply Just for Men and in five minutes shampoo out. Gray is blended away. The look of my natural color is back in five minutes. That was me. And it won't fade or wash out. My hair takes forever, but you look great in just five minutes. The look of your natural color in just five minutes with Just for Men. Which scoopable litter would the experts prefer? A leading litter or new Scoop Fresh cat litter? They both clump. But does your litter freshen between scoops? Well, that proves it. New Scoop Fresh freshens better between scoops. The BBC, Turner Broadcasting and Time Life Video dare you to take a walk on the wild side with Trials of Life. The gripping, award-winning nature video series that exposes the struggle to survive through uncensored, shocking photography. Join acclaimed naturalist David Attenborough for a close encounter with raw nature. See the thrill of the hunt and the strategy of the kill, the relentless drive to continue the bloodline and the miracle of birth. Call now and receive hunting and escaping for $9.99 and see why the law of the jungle is kill or be killed. If it captures your interest, you can get other videos about every other month. Each tape explores the harsh realities of survival in the animal world. Take a walk on the wild side with Trials of Life. Call now to order hunting and escaping and find out why we call them animals. To order your Trials of Life video, call 1-800-632-9191 or send $9.99 plus $3.23 shipping and handling to the address on your screen. As Roger Payne turns his love affair with whales into an urgent call for action, he is joined by his wife, Lisa Hara, the renowned New Zealand-born and British-trained actress whom he met at a Greenpeace rally. Beyond the lesson you've learned from the whales, what has studying them taught you about life, about the sense of, of um, our future and where we go from here? We can, you know, every day we save matters. And the whole, the, the whole, the whole basis of what we do, I think, now has to somehow change in terms of its urgency. I have spent a lifetime mourning over the fact that there aren't enough conservationists. I fully believe that when people recognize how dangerous things are, that the only thing anybody will be interested in is conservation. They won't care about anything else. You know, there are some who will look for you, some scientists, you know, and say, Roger has gone beyond science. He's become an advocate. Guilty as charged, but I have not left science behind. I've brought it with me. And my feeling is the important thing is, unless a person is brave enough to advocate something, to believe in something and state it and, and stand on it, in other words, to, to live by their beliefs, then I don't see any hope at all. None. Just none. But when you took that step, did you know you were taking with some risk in terms of your peers? Oh, totally. Yeah, Charlie, I mean, I learned years and years ago that you don't get any credit at all for making some effort to say things as they are. I mean, that is, it's a no-no. It's, a, it's, a, it's self-destruction, basically, is what it amounts to. And what is important is to decide how urgent is it that one does act, that one has the guts to decide, okay, fine, so that, that gives me a problem, I'll take the problem. The only security that comes in this life is the willingness to risk everything. I believe that fervently. And if you don't risk everything, you, you know, you don't have a life. Yeah. Lisa, what makes him different? He's the nearest to, thing to a Renaissance man I've ever met, I've ever imagined meeting. He has a vision that was the first thing that struck me when I first met him. I mean, that's what I swam in when I first met him. The vision of? Well, he has a vision of a perfect world, a healed world, um, that it is we are all part of something. We, we as a human race are not the kings of this earth. And too long we've believed that. So it's very rare to meet a human being who believes that, that they're not the king of the domain in which they live. Also, he is enormously funny. <laughs> he's a man, as, as he's a, um, a be behavioral scientist, you can't get away with anything with him. He knows exactly, he reads you like a book. He understands he, motivation. He plays the cello like an angel. Um, he, he keeps me... Um, completely entranced in, uh, um, in, in areas of literature and stuff like that, stuff that, you know, you don't expect to meet someone who can quote great screeds of literature as well as know about molecular structure. These things 
don't normally go hand in hand. And he, he lives with a passion, which is very remarkable. When you play the cello, <laughs> can you hear in your own mind the songs of the humpback whale? Yes, but they're more beautiful than anything I've ever played, <laughs> because that's my problem as a cellist. As a musician. Yeah. As a musician. They are, they really speak to your soul completely. I mean, every now and then you hear a musical performance that just blows your all your fuses, basically, because it's so powerful. It really connects with you. But somehow whales have, you know, they've been singing about 20 million years longer than we have, and they presumably know all about singing. They know what... I have a theory, Charlie, which is that right. singing actually is older than our species. In fact, very, very much older <coughs> than our species. Whales and we have been on separate paths for 20 million years. They've been in the ocean, and our ancestors and all that time have been on land. There's no way they could have heard our songs, no way we could have heard theirs until just recently. And yet they obey the same musical laws. They have the same laws, conventions of form in their music. And because of that, it's... You know, it starts saying, hey, wait a minute, the vertebrate brain, whether it's located in the head of a whale or the head of a person, is entertained by a small handful of things. Why? And, you know, what is it that music gives you? Why is it such a compelling thing? Why, you know, why are these the high priests of our culture, the modern uh, the musicians of today? And I think it's because they speak to a mind that is older than the cortex. They speak to uh, the brain stem or closer to the brain stem. They are emotion expressed somehow. And so that's why people pay attention to songs, and they actually, we are, we are being sung to by our lizard past, if you will. Charlie Rose and Roger Payne will return on the Discovery Channel. This portion of Discovery is sponsored in part by Microsoft, making personal computing easier. Microsoft Excel can take any spreadsheet figure and easily turn it into a beautiful fact. All you do is point and click. Microsoft Excel, the spreadsheet for Windows. We'd like to point out that for 10 million people, Microsoft Windows is an easier way to use their PCs. We'd now like to point out how easy it is to see for yourself. Just call 1-800-882-2000. Come on, Becky! So you're Australian, huh? Yeah, I'm from... I always wanted to go to Australia. Oh, really? Hey, wouldn't it be great if we could drop in right now? <laughs> Wide open spaces. You can breathe the air. Uh-huh. And that Great Barrier Reef is really colorful. It's all kaleidoscopic. Is that true? That's true. And you get seashells by the seashore, I bet. Some bigger than others. Spectacular, huh? It's hot and dry and all red and everything, right? Yeah, in places. I hear the people are real friendly, am I right? Uh-huh. You Aussies, go on and on about your wonderful beaches. We do tend to get carried away. No kidding. Fair income. Fair income. For your free copy of the Destination Australia book, call 1-800-333-2185. Or hop on a Qantas flight. I bet you there's one leaving right now. Air Dinkum. <laughs> I love it. Ah, a new arrival. A tire so special, it may last as long as you own your car. The new XH4. Congratulations. It's a Michelin. Ringer Lawn Restore. What could be more natural? My day. It's all around us. Aggression, violence, and hate. But why do we encourage this behavior? And what drives the dark side of our nature? Host Phil Donahue asks, why do we kill? As he examines war and violence on the continuing series, The Human Animal, Friday at 10 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. What's the great unanswered question that you have searched for and you don't know? What is the brain of these extraordinary animals used for? And I haven't a clue. Not 
a clue as to what it's used for. I mean, that to me is the most exciting thing of all. Coexisting with a species of greater complexity of, m of mental capability, perhaps, than our own. Well, I, haven't, I haven't any idea what it's for. None. And if you were giving a lecture to a young scientist, young man just leaving Cornell and Harvard and Duke and Yale and Northwestern and Notre Dame and Southern Cal and all the schools, to go out into the world of science, the world of exploration, the world to help the rest of us understand how it works. What would you want to say to them? I'd say, do what you believe in. Do what you think is important and does matter. Don't waste your life just doing somebody else's chores. And do what you think is important. Until people do that, they're not alive. They aren't living. And once they can do it, then they, they can go beyond anything they could ever imagine. I mean, somebody once said you can achieve anything you can dream. Yeah, that's true. We can. <laughs> And if you look back at your life to determine if it has been successful, how will you measure success? The, to me, it is if people have a greater sense of the wild world, if the wild, if whales are a larger part of human culture, if they are more a part of us, if they are lodged deeper in our hearts, and if with them, their lives, the sea, all of this is a greater part of our life, then I think I would die happy. Natural wonders threatened by man, advances in medicine, and the breathtaking progress of science. It's hard to grasp the nature of things, but David Suzuki can help. He's next, only on the Discovery Channel. Best of the BBC, Sundays at 8 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. Okay, say you're a countertop and you find yourself with this blueberry stain. Now, you know there are some kinds of powders that are harsh and can scratch. So, would you want to be cleaned by one of them? Or, would you go for the soft scrub with Clorox bleach, which lifts out tough stains without harsh scratching? <sighs> so, what's it going to be? A harsh powder or soft scrub with Clorox bleach? <laughs> Oh, wise choice. Soft scrub with bleach. Yes! Preferred by countertop. The new cable channel where you come to know. Watch the Learning Channel in the spirit of discovery. What do you think? I'll take the Sony. Ask your cable company for the Learning Channel. It's just good thinking. When you're flying north, fly with the leader. Fly the airline that leads the way to Canada with more flights to more cities. With more service and more hospitality. Even more legroom on the only business class to more of Canada. Air Canada. It's a welcome departure. In June, the world's leaders meet in Brazil to set an environmental strategy for saving the planet. Now, find out what's at stake on television's most comprehensive look at the issues facing us today. Join the Discovery Channel for a week of premier programs ranging from rainforest destruction in Malaysia to wildlife preservation in Canada. State of the Natural World, beginning Monday, May 25th at 10 Eastern, only on the Discovery Channel. It's your world. Brought to you in part by Lexus Automobiles.